Polynesian Pip, how you doing? Cough. <laughs> how you doing, my friend? Audio okay for you? Hard Rock, how you doing? When do we start? We're going to start very soon. Um, I just saw you guys come into the room and I was kind of wondering, hey, is um, <laughs> where is everyone? So glad that you folks chimed in. Habar, how you doing? Great. Good afternoon from Seattle. How's everything up there? Five, five, great. Thanks, guys. Bobby Jones, how you doing? Dwayne Roberts, full name. Good morning. And with that, I guess we can uh, <clears throat> go ahead and um, move on with the, <clears throat> excuse me, please move on with the program. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television. This is the live stream where mistakes do happen, so just bear with me as we move along. Glad you all could be here. I'm just curious how things are wherever you live. I know there's a pretty good diversity of, from you guys. Where you know everyone's from all different places, such as Melbourne, as we see here with with Hard Rock, Polynesian Pip. Um, just wondering what it's like for you guys as the world goes through this lockdown. Um, Things are very, very different, and um, I'm, I'm just really wondering how it's going to be once we get out of it. And I'm sure all of you guys are wondering the same thing as well. Uh, but nonetheless, if you are new to this channel or you have not already done so, please do subscribe. Click on the bell to be notified on updates and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do. And as always, you can find us on social media. You can find us on our website, www.silverbullion.com.sg. We are a bullion dealer over in Singapore, and this is our website where you can buy and store precious metals over in Singapore. Facebook, Silver Bullion SG. Twitter, at Silver Bullion PL, PL for Private Limited. The audio versions can be found on bit.ly, bit.ly, SBTV iTunes, and SBTV Spotify. And we do hope you join our Crisis Tracker group. If you do have that Telegram app, go ahead and... Um, log in or sign up anyway for a crisis tracker where we go over financial news and and things like that that uh, do affect our our daily lives or even our future lives so again glad you all could be here thank you for for um showing up <clears throat> new york new york <laughs> how's things in new york i know you folks have had it pretty rough there civil warrior how are you doing uh let's see calhoun busby first time i think i've seen you here welcome aboard um Canada, okay. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Excuse me, Max Strong, how you doing? Haven't seen you in a while. Michael B. Time to reopen the economy. You know, that seems to be the sentiment going around more and more. And um, I'm um, I'm I'm slowly starting to um, jump on that train as well. You know, um, it, I, I guess because at first my position with this whole virus thing was you got to start out with. <clears throat> excuse me is it man-made or is it natural and for me my opinion was man-made and because man-made <clears throat> excuse me because i felt it's man-made as a lot of you guys do out there um if you're going to make something i mean it's going to be more than just the flu you're not going to replicate or duplicate the flu that that's already out there so so, you know, I think at first, you know, a lot of guys, we were kind of wondering what's going on. And, and we all had to make that decision. Is this thing natural or is it man-made? And I don't think we fully really know yet. And that's why there still remains a lot of uncertainty. But we'll see as time as time goes on. William Cruz, howdy. How are you doing? Uh, let's see. George Kaiser, good to see you. Free live stream. <laughs> Good to see you also. I mean, I wish I could see you guys, but, um, you know, try to do what we can, you know, especially when it comes to what's what's going on nowadays. You know, I mean, it, there's just seems to be a blanket of truth all over the place. And a lot of us, you know, hey, we're just we're just trying to get through, you know, day to day. We've worked hard for our families. Some of us have accumulated a good deal of wealth and, and we need to protect that and uh, make sure that all of this is OK. And these are some of the things that, that we do over at um, Silver Bullion. Um, how do you guys like Rick Rule? The, the interview seems to be doing pretty good. I think Rick gave a lot of great information, so I'm just curious how, as to how you guys feel about uh, Rick Rule. Bonzo, 22, how's Singapore? Um, I think the, there's been a little bit more uh, in, encroachment going on. Um, when 
coronavirus first came here, oh, geez, I said the word. Now I'm going to get demonetized, huh? <laughs> when, when the bug first came here, I think Singapore handled it very, very, very well. And things were good. Uh, but over time, you know, we, we saw other countries explode, you know, with, with um, the bug. And um, Singapore is no different. It started uh, to grow here as, as well. But I think the government's doing pretty pretty darn well in, in handling it. And um, it's a global thing. You know, I, I don't think any country is going to get through this un, unscathed. Maybe a couple but um, or a few, but I, I don't think um, every country is going to have to deal with it and deal with it in, in their own way. So, yeah, it's a pretty good question. Uh, Booty, 718, what do I think about 401k? My position with 401k has always been if, if you can roll it over or – not always, I should say, as I looked more into it. If you can roll over that 401k, um, my, my opinion, it's not advice professional or otherwise, my opinion with a 401k is I would roll it over into something like a SD IRA, a self-directed IRA, into something like a precious metals IRA. So that way you're out of the paper system because a lot of times 401ks stocks bonds mutual funds things like that it's it's paper so um you saw the rise as the stock market was going up you saw it go up uh but now with the way things are you know it's it's getting pretty dicey um for that reason or specifically this reason i would have said you know go ahead and roll it over into some type of uh precious metals ira or whatever you can so that way whatever happens with the fiat system you're you're out of it so Things like that can can really protect you in, in ways maybe we we've, we've never really never really looked at. It. So anyway, um, Rick Rule, yeah, he was a great guest. Uh, we appreciated him coming on. And coming up on SBTV, we're going to have Thomas Malinen. Um, he's over in Finland. We we've interviewed him once before, and and uh, response is very 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 good. He's an interesting guy. He holds a PhD in, in economy. Uh, he's a CEO and chief economist of GNS Economics. He's also an adjunct professor of economics at the University of Helsinki, and he has studied economics in the University of Helsinki and the New York University. He specializes in economic growth, economic crisis, central banks, and the business cycle. Tuomas is currently writing a book on how financial crisis can be forecasted. And then we also have Jeff Dice interesting interesting guy we've had him on once before great info if you can look back for jeff dice um go ahead and look back as to as to what he had to say he's the president of the mises institute where he serves as a writer public speaker and advocate for property market and civil society he previously worked as a longtime advisor and chief of staff to congressman ron paul for whom he wrote hundreds of articles and speeches so jeff dice you know he's i tell you he's a he's got a lot of powder he's, he's he's a big gun you know what he says makes a lot of sense out there um what else is out there um a couple more a couple more of your um comments here uh jk co unprecedented event tomorrow real estate agents receiving unemployment as well as an extra six hundred dollars a week they will begin universal basic income. Where's this at, JK? Um, I, I haven't heard much about it. It's, it's, it's really hard to keep up with, with the news nowadays. Uh, really, really hard. Uh, Bonzo22, Rico's informative. Great, great. Um, hope he had something in there for you. Um, he, he said, he made some pretty good statements. Uh, one I'll play at the end. Um, okay, so um, Calhoun, Busby. When gold goes above 3,000, announce... There will be lots of buyers. That is true. And in fact, that specific number, 3,000, we're going to talk about. And we are going to talk about a lot of buyers. And, and we're going to relate that to what happened in the oil markets uh, earlier last week when, when we saw um, the futures. Uh, the futures market in oil really um, take a hit. Actually went negative. I think negative 40 at one point. Wasn't that pretty, pretty crazy? But you know, nonetheless, let's go ahead and, and take a look at gold right now. We'll head over to our, our website, silverbullion.com.sg. You can sign up for a free account. Um, it doesn't cost anything to maintain an account. So if you, you ever had any ideas of, you know, 
vault questions or storing overseas in a different jurisdiction, uh, go ahead and uh, let me type this in. You can contact us at uh, sales at silverbullion.com.sg if you have any questions. So we're seeing silver still in that mid $15 per ounce range. Gold still $17.27. I think it touched $17.30 last week um, at, at some point for a while. And then we saw it go down again late in the week and it, it bounced back a bit. So gold really, um, it's, it, I tell you that there seems to just be a lot of struggle with, with gold right now. And, and a lot of it has to do with the paper markets, which of course we're, we're going to get into in a bit. So those are some of the, the things going on. And, um, but you guys, you've, you've, you've had a lot of great info or great input and, and we appreciate that. Um, let's see a couple more questions and then I'll, I'll take a look at, uh, some news in, in Twitter. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. Yeah, a lot of you guys got a lot of good points out there. I think you guys are doing great with each other right now. Uh, I'll get into Twitter, some of the, the things on Twitter right now. Then you guys seem to be okay with each other. Good debates going on. Yeah, JK, that'd be good if you could if you could get the link. So with Twitter, uh, internet's a bit slow again. I've been coming across some pretty interesting things. Meat shortages are coming in May. So that, that's one thing. How are you guys doing out there with your groceries? I, I mean, I'm hearing that uh, it may not be necessarily a shortage, but you're seeing that maybe some brands or some, um, some items just aren't really there anymore. Your selection, I should say, your, your selection is starting to lessen. So I'm kind of curious how you guys are doing out there with, um, with food. And then we had, uh, this is pretty interesting. From CNBC, coronavirus crisis will likely change capitalism forever. Uh, change capitalism forever. That's that's um some pretty hard words. Maybe we'll take a peek at, at what this gentleman is talking about. Leon Cooperman says the coronavirus crisis will change capitalism forever and taxes have to go up. That part, yeah, taxes are going to go up. There's no way that governments uh, can't even collect enough taxes to pay for all this this uh, money printing and, and debt that, that's on the books right now. So let's uh, see what he had to say. There may be an ad. If you can't come to us, always is. we'll come to you. So let's Need an instant check of your just personal get through this ad for a bit. You've got it, just the way you want it. What's the latest in global market news? You're the first to. Yeah, so we'll just get through that, that ad for a bit. Okay, hang on. Let me get back to him. All right lasting implications to the long term. So let me share what your view is, your listeners, my list of 10 items. Number one, capitalism as we know it will likely be changed forever. When the government is called upon to protect you on the downside, they have every right to regulate the upside. So capitalism has changed. Second, the country is moving slowly to the left. Taxes have to go up. Quickly, if Biden wins, slowly if Trump wins, but taxes have to go up. So things like carried interest, capital gains taxes, uh, the uh, ability to roll over real estate sales tax-free, all that stuff is going to have to be eliminated, uh, for the good, by the way. Okay. Uh, also, I've indicated in the past, Consistently, low interest rates are indicative of a troubled economy and should not be viewed positively. You have negative interest rates in Japan. You have negative interest rates in Europe. Yet their price earnings ratios are lower than the U.S. price earnings ratio. Okay, so uh, I would say that uh, the, the level of interest rates is not in itself bullish. Uh, I think also a fourth item on my list: demand is likely to come back slowly. Uh, you know, if you think of a sporting event or a concert, I can't imagine. They'll come back until we have a vaccination. Everybody will have to have a vaccination card. If you want access to a sporting event or a concert, you have to show your vaccination card to get a, a admittance. So I think we come back slowly. Okay. Wow. That's, um, that's pretty, pretty different. How do you guys feel about that? Going to a sporting event or things like that, you're going to need a vaccination card as far as he's saying. And he's saying, um, Taxes, taxes are going to have to be raised. I'm, I'm kind of looking at, um, you know, 
it, it's just too much. I mean, the U.S. is not bankrupt, as I've said before. Even with all the debt, it's not bankrupt. You still have Agland and, and a whole bunch of other things, which is the concern because if, um, you know, you may have to use those things because – I think the law right now is the Federal Reserve cannot loan any money unless there is collateral. So, you know, we got to really dig deep and find out what collateral is, is, is out there for the Federal Reserve or what collateral are they taking. And so, you know, we, we need to really be kind of um, sharp as to really figure out and find out what this, this collateral is. Um, but what do you guys think about that? Uh, sporting events, vaccination cards. You guys okay with that? Um, Jorge. Argudo, excuse me, no vaccines for me. Okay. Uh, Faye Selha pumping the mandatory vaccines. Yeah, you know, you've, you're hearing more and more about that. You know, it's, they, they really seem to be pumping it. Regal Legal vaccination scam. Um, truth teller, I'm not going to take Bill Gates' vaccination. No way. No way I will be taking a vaccine. Faye, no vaccines. Um, Tony, when you touch a roach, they, they wash themselves. Okay, I'm trying to imagine a clean roach, my friend. That's that's a good one. Michael B, no vaccine. LLD and the Fed, I'm with you there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so Abraham C, no vaccine card. Um, I, I'm. It, it's it's really no vaccine. I, I can um, see from a lot of your comments. A lot of you guys are, are not. Uh, not down with that. Faye vaccines equals total loss of autonomy. Yeah, you know, that's, um, I think anytime you want to force something on, on someone, you know, you start to have two, two different lanes of people where you have one lane, the government knows what's best for me. I will just follow them and, and do whatever they, they say. They have my best interest. And then you have that other lane of, of people or that other division where just don't or can't trust the government. You know, I mean, they've, they've already proven themselves in, in what they do. And a lot of times it may not be in, in your best interest. So, you know, I, I, I see your points. Vaccines, um, it's going to be a hot debate for sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if that even is going to come into the 2020 presidential debates. I'm sure it, debates, I'm sure it will. Uh, it's, that's going to be a very, very interesting thing to see so let me go ahead and take a look at uh, other things that were on twitter that caught my attention oil scary traders were saying very very scary well these were paper traders of course the speculators they were these were guys that were never going to take delivery of oil so scary for them you know they they want to say the the price is scary but i think it's more um they were scared that they might have actually had to have taken delivery so you know it's scary in, in what what context right all the smart money dalio Druckenmiller, miller tudor jones zell goodluck singer Klarman, einhorn mobius and some who i know are loading up but are doing it quietly or long gold and understand the simple concept okay and we're, we're going to kind of touch this about guys going long gold right now uh, we're, we're going to touch on that and we're going to compare it to what happened with the oil futures market. I mean, it's it's, it's a pretty um interesting comparison. Jan Neuenhuis, uh, sorry, Kuz Johnson. I'll stick with Kuz Johnson. Fed could go negative next week. I have no idea how that would create growth during a pandemic wherein everyone is in lockdown. And that's the thing, you know. How are, even if you go negative, how is that supposed to help the economy with the way things are right now? And I would like to click on this article, but it's Bloomberg, and um, you only get like three free articles a month, so got to kind of let that one slide. Venezuela in the streets during regime quarantine because no food is arriving during gasoline shortages. Gasoline shortages. Interesting. Okay. And then we have uh, David Stockman. Virus lockdown is flat out fraud on a massive scale. And... Stockman, if you if you follow him, you know he's um he's he's pretty moderate in in what he has to say. Some things are you know a little bit this way, some things are a little bit that way. But um, he's his own man, and he's been in government for quite a while, and and he knows how how it works. So we'll just take a quick peek as to what he says about uh, this being a a lockdown or the lockdown being a fraud. 
We want to welcome on David Stockman, former director of the Office of Management and Budget under President Ronald Reagan. Sir, thanks for making the time for us. Happy to be with you. Coronavirus has exposed many weaknesses in our government, state and the federal, among them national debt, which it seems that Congress has ignored for decades. How worried are you that we will get to a point where America won't be able to pay the interest on our debt, much less pay down the debt at all? Well, I have a news flash for Governor Cuomo and most of Washington. We do not have a uh, rich uncle named Sam. We are heading uh, for disaster fiscally at a speed that is breathtaking. They have now passed three or four bills. There's uh, all of this additional pending for the state bailouts that you've been talking about. But even before that, we're going to spend $7 trillion in this fiscal year. Revenue is collapsing, and we'll get to that in a moment to less than $3 trillion because of the disaster of lockdown nation. We're going to borrow $4 trillion this year, 19% of GDP. That's World War II scale when we were fighting a global war. So I think what we need to understand is that lockdown nation is the greatest catastrophe of modern times. Okay, it um, it's kind of long, but uh, lockdown is, is the greatest catastrophe of of all times is what uh david stockman is saying uh you know it's um it, i tell you this thing you know it, it can go so many different ways you know and it's tough when you're trying to look at every single different angle and and play each angle out and, and strategize which which road you need to be on and if you need to change lanes here and there and i know you guys are good at doing that and you know it, it's something we really really got to watch but looking back at one of your, your comments here, Roger, gold is oil upside down. And that's what we're, we're really going to get into because, you know, what we saw with the, um, the oil futures markets last week, it can definitely relate to, uh, to gold. Oil and gold, we, we know they're, they're pretty much correlated. And... Um, we're going to take a look, and that's that's what this program is going to be about. Early last week, we saw some incredible things happen in that oil market. We saw oil futures go negative. Story goes, oil went negative because oil consumption is low, and as oil keeps coming to the market, there simply is no place to put it. Nobody wants it. And that posed a huge problem for longs because they, frankly speaking, they're speculators, or a lot were speculators, and they were now on the hook to take delivery, and none of them had none of them had any intention of taking delivery. End result, longs, sell, 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 get rid of it, get rid of the contract, whatever you have to do, get rid of the contract, and we saw oil go negative, oil futures go negative. And we are going to see how this very same thing can play out with gold, but in the opposite way, just as Roger said, it's upside down, and we're going to... We're going to take a look at this. Now, some things I find is, is you know, if oil stays at low prices below $30 per barrel, 40% of producers are going to go out of business. And I'll reference that article. And as a result, President Trump is going to have to bail out. No matter what you want to call it, he's going to have to bail out the shale oil industry. You guys might remember... We touched on oil a month or so back, and after looking at this event, the event of Saudi and Russia in a spat, so to say, or so we are led to believe they're in sort of a spat, I brought that up back then, and I said that I wouldn't be so fast to believe what was being reported, and straight away for me, this was, it was BS. Um, something wasn't right with this. And I wasn't buying the story coming from the media. And I know a lot of you guys, you weren't buying that story as well. And we, we touched on it. So fast forward today, we're seeing more guys coming out who are seeing what you and I had already discussed a month ago. President Trump has gone to great lengths to pledge support for this industry. He helped broker, or at least reportedly helped broker that deal between Russia and OPEC and committed the U.S. to it. I mean, the whole world was stepping in 
to stop the fall of the price of oil. And even if this is sort of technical in nature and a paper loss on a front month contract, it's a reminder of just how little demand there is for oil and how much supply there is and what the price collapse is going to do. And I'm wondering how you think it's going to impact the politics and the economics of this country going forward. I mean, guys, it's so easy to see what's happening here. And it needs to be talked about more by people like you. But we're having the largest economic crisis from a, from a uh, percentage of GDP perspective, maybe that the world's ever had collectively all at once. And that just so happens to be the exact time that Saudi and Russia decide to, quote, have a dispute over OPEC production cuts and the fact that the U.S. shale business has gone from producing you know, five, six million barrels a day to 11 million barrels a day, the U.S. was actually energy independent. And that changes the politics of how we interact with the Middle East and Russia dramatically. And the Middle East and Russia don't like that. Okay, and, and that's exactly what we were looking at a month ago, where, where the politics have changed. Politics of oil have changed. And it's more than just oil, because a lot of you guys already know when it comes to oil, you're dealing with the petrol dollar. And you're also dealing with the dollar as, as uh, the world reserve currency. So these things, you know, they, when they unfold, they unfold in a lot of different directions and they unfold far. It's not just something that, that's contained. It, this is a, a big, it's a global thing. And one other guy that had something to say that, or, or speak on this was Peter Schiff. Which, look, maybe it's a coincidence that they decided to throw out uh, the OPEC agreement and pump all this oil uh, and we have a pandemic uh, with the coronavirus. Maybe it's just a coincidence or maybe they basically picked their spot and said this would be the perfect time to completely decimate the U.S. oil industry, especially you know, Donald Trump is out there bragging about how great the oil industry is, how we have the greatest economy ever, and they can destroy that industry. And they know that our industry is a house of cards. We're actually cheating with all of our cheap money and, and what the Fed is doing. So maybe they actually got together and this is not an accident, that this is by design. This is uh, OPEC or Russia taking advantage of a crisis, just like Congress is taking advantage of this crisis to grab more power and to spend more money and to, and to suspend our, our, our rights and our liberties. Maybe uh, Saudis or Russia said, hey, this is when the U.S. is really vulnerable the U.S. oil industry. So let's take advantage of that. Let's like really kick them when they're down. Well, maybe they're not just thinking about oil. Maybe they realize that we have an even greater vulnerability with the U.S. dollar. Okay. <clears throat> even greater vulnerability with the U.S. dollar. And um, I, I think Peter is, is spot on with um with um what he's looking at i think kyle bass is is spot on as well and and you guys too i mean like i said we we talked about this about a month ago when that whole story first broke where uh saudi and russia were i use that word spat um <clears throat> we weren't buying it a lot of us we we were not buying it we knew there was uh, we we had a feeling there's something more that that's going on and looking at your comments i think a lot of you guys are, are saying the same daniel the plumber the world wants off the petrol dollar that is true you know we've we've followed i mean if, if you follow this live stream you know we've talked about instex where europe has developed their own um swift system rival in order to uh move money in order to handle transactions and uh, this is something that uh if it goes through that system u.s can't see what's what's going on uh, some people may like that some people may not uh, but there are things in place already that um already are there to get off of of the dollar uh the thing that is very dangerous with this whole petrol dollar is is i think you know most of us already also know that um it's not going to go away quietly um but i don't think the petrol dollar will simply die and go away i don't think the u.s dollar as a reserve currency will simply die and, and go away either so i i think there are some um there are some major events coming our way. That's that. That's for sure. Uh, Calhoun Busby, they want to kill the reserve dollar. Pudenda Johnson, Rick Rule rules. Yeah, Rick, he did. Uh, he did really great. I mean, he's always got, he's always got good info. Um, let's see what else is out there. Uh, Mark Hill, George Gammon, I love that guy. George Gammon is great. He also calls out the Federal Reserve. 
yeah, you know, it's um, the Fed. I I think uh, it's it's time. You know, they they, they they've got to go. They failed in their uh, as far as unemployment. You know, that was one of their mandates, right? Uh, unemployment and and uh, holding the purchasing power of the dollar. Actually, they they failed in both. So, or dollar price stability, dollar stability, price stability. I I think they've actually failed in both. They got to go. Um, let's see what else is out there. Okay. Okay. You guys are doing fine. <laughs> you guys got a lot of great comments. You guys are doing, you guys are doing great. So after Peter Schiff, you know, and Kyle Bass and what we looked at over a month ago, speculation is we have Saudi potentially working with Russia to flood the world with cheap oil and create a glut, create a glut to perhaps bring down the U S shell industry and we're seeing trump struggling to to keep it afloat and let's not forget about china who is the largest oil consumer and wants to buy that cheap oil in one everybody would like to buy cheap oil right so we, we we um everybody would like cheap oil and they are the largest consumer right now and you got to go back to the time when the petrodollar was made saudi was the largest oil producer exporter u.s was the largest consumer Things have changed. This was almost 50 years ago when that, that deal was made. Things have changed. China is the largest consumer now, which means, of course, if you're Saudi, you are going to lend an ear more to what China is saying, especially with the U.S. competitor. So things have changed. You know, things have definitely changed. Um, China is the largest oil consumer and wants to buy that cheap oil in yuan. They want to buy it in yuan. And, you know, if we're going to be fair about this, if you're a, you would not want to have to change your currency to another currency to buy something you want, right? I mean, let's say you you go down to, I don't know, call it the candy shop, and and you gotta go and exchange your dollars into, into uh, Australian dollars before you can before you can buy that candy. It's a bit of a a nuisance, right? Well, multiply that by a factor of how. <laughs> Multiply that by oil, which is the world over and every country having to do that. Every country would appreciate being able to use their own dollar, which means they don't appreciate not having to use another dollar. And and that's another thing that uh, it's on people's minds. You know, the whole petrodollar, U.S. dollar, reserve currency thing. And but why the concern and why the concern? We um we took a look at this last month or so when we came across this article and again this was in 2014 okay december of 2014 so this is like six years ago did the saudis and the u.s collude in dropping oil prices we could easily change that title to did the saudis and russia collude in dropping oil prices a lot of names countries can be changed here in this article back in 2014 the oil price drop that has dominated the headlines in recent weeks, again, this is 2014, has been framed almost exclusively in terms of oil market economics and most media outlets blaming Saudi Arabia through its OPEC Trojan horse for driving down the price, thus causing serious damage to the world's major oil exporters. So we can, most notably Russia, so we can say we can keep Saudi here, uh, Saudi Arabia through its OPEC Trojan horse driving down the price. We saw this and causing serious damage to the world's major oil exporters, most notably. And we can substitute Russia for the United States. And this is what's really interesting about this article. Like I said, you can really easily change countries around. While the market explanation is partially true, it's simplistic and fails to address key geopolitical pressure points in the Middle East. This time, that pressure point would be China wanting to buy oil in yuan. Uh, that, that's the pressure point right now in the Middle East or, or with, with Saudi. Uh, Oilprice.com looked beyond the headlines for the reason behind the oil price drop and found that the explanation, while difficult to prove, may revolve around control of oil and gas in the Middle East and the weakening, the weakening of Russia, Iran, and Syria by flooding the market with cheap oil. As I said, you could easily replace Russia with the U.S. Iran and Saudi aren't exactly friends. And 
neither is Saudi and Syria. I don't think they're actually on friendly terms right now as well. So you could easily substitute countries again. We don't have to look too far back in history to see Saudi Arabia, the world's largest oil exporter and producer, using the oil price to achieve its foreign policy objectives. 73 Egyptian. Okay, let me just kind of go through through this. Um, 86 Saudi Arabia led OPEC. Saudi Arabia led OPEC allowed prices to drop, and they've done this again. And then in 90, when Saudi sent prices plummeting as a way of taking out Russia. Okay, so Saudi is known to do these things. Okay, taking out Russia which was seen as a threat to their oil supremacy. In 1998, they succeeded when the oil price was halved from 25 to 12. Russia defaulted on its debt. Again, this time around, with the U.S. shale industry and U.S. oil, or let's say U.S. does not, uh, at least that's what we've been told, don't or does not really import oil. Uh, it's, it's self-sustained with, with oil. And has become, I think, the leading oil producer in, in the world. So Saudi has some competition with the U.S. as they did with Russia, which was why they took out Russia. And in taking out Russia, you got to remember, they colluded with the U.S. when they did this. Okay, so it, it, this, is the, this is the thing. Okay, they do use oil to get their political gains. The Saudis and other OPEC members have, of course, used the oil price for the adverse effect, that is, suppressing production to keep prices artificially high and member states swimming in petrodollars. The thing is, today, a lot of guys don't want the U.S. dollar. I mean, it's strong right now, yes, but with that U.S. dollar comes sanctions, comes a little bit of control, um, and they also weaponize the dollar. So I think a lot of countries, they do want to get off of that dollar. So this article, you know, let me, um, I'll put the link in here. It's a pretty interesting article. You guys can um, go ahead and, and take a look at it if, if you want on your, on your own. Um, it's a really great article for, for that time. And the thing is, you know, we're looking at history right now with what happened back in uh, 2014, I think it was 2014, 20, yeah, 2014. We're looking at history, and history does tell us about a glut that happened in the 80s. And we also went over this about a month ago, where in the 80s there, there was a glut where there was simply too much oil. Um, let me just go down a bit to, to the main point in this article of what history tells us with, with this glut. The impact. The 1986 oil price collapse benefited oil-consuming countries such as the United States. And this time we're going to have to substitute the U.S. for China uh, because this low oil is going to benefit China. It's not going to benefit the U.S. this time around, uh, mainly because China is the consumer this time and U.S. is a producer this time around. So again, uh, the, the pieces on the political chessboard are changing and overall, the gist or the main point here, the Soviet Union, a lot of you guys, well, if you're my age, you're going to remember the USSR. Soviet Union had become a major oil producer before the glut, and that can be substituted with the U.S. The United States has become a major oil producer before the glut. And this is the part we need to pay attention to. The drop of oil prices, oil prices contributed to the nation's final collapse. The Soviet Union had become a major oil producer before the glut. The drop of oil prices contributed to the nation's final collapse. And that, that's history. You know, history either repeats or rhymes. And, you know, this is why when, when this whole first thing about uh, Saudi and Russia with their, their little uh, lovers quarrel, uh, we weren't buying it. You weren't buying it. I, I definitely was not buying it as well. It's, it's a dangerous thing right now. You know, it's, it's definitely a dangerous thing. So we know history points out that in the 80s, the U.S., the largest oil consumer at that time, and Saudi, the largest oil producer exporter at that time, 
basically ganged up on the USSR to bring their oil industry to their knees. Today, the USSR is no more. And things have changed. More people are clearly seeing that the motive for creating a glut of oil is meant to hurt the U.S. shale industry. Saudi is still in the picture. Russia knows how much damage a glut and cheap oil can do. But this time around, we also have China in the equation. And why China? Because as mentioned, it's no secret that China wants to use their one to buy oil. They are the biggest consumer right now. And Saudi is going to lend an ear to what China has to say. Saudi also wants to sell oil in Wan, and China may, they may indeed, you know, I can't say this one with 100% certainty, but they may indeed have the storage capacity for global excess oil. Um, you try and find how much storage capacity for oil China has. Uh, it's tough to do, but even if you do find it, it's a national, um, it's, it's a national, it's a very secret type of a thing. You're, I don't think you're ever really going to expose to, to your adversaries how much oil you can, you can keep, right? So, I mean, I think even if you had a number come out from China, I'm certain that it would be higher. Uh, and whatever number you find as far as storage capacity, I'm sure it's, it's, it's even more than that. So, you know, it, they may have that storage capacity and all the pieces to the puzzle fit. You know, I mean, we are speculating here, but, you know, it, it does seem to, to fit. And guys like Schiff and Bass, they see it. Trump even sees it as, as he's trying to uh, keep the industry afloat. And, and we saw this um, when we were, were researching even back in that, that uh, live stream about a month ago where the Department of Energy responds to recent oil market activity. This is referring to that, that Saudi and Russia lovers quarrel. The Trump administration is closely monitoring the impact of the bug and the fallout from last week's OPEC Plus meeting on global markets. OPEC Plus meaning Saudi and Russia. These attempts, here's a part. These attempts by state actors, okay? These attempts by state actors to manipulate and shock oil markets. Reinforce the importance of the role of the U.S. as a reliable energy supplier to partners and allies around the world. So the U.S. is trying to say, hey, these guys are going to play games. And we know the history where OPEC will manipulate the amount of oil that comes onto the market to either drive up or drive down oil price. And so the U.S. is basically saying, look, I guess buy from us and we're more reliable than, than these guys. But even so, whatever the, the meaning is behind what he's saying, these attempts by state actors to manipulate and shock oil markets. That's, that, that's the key part, you know, the attempts to manipulate the oil market. So that's the political, geopolitical side to the story. And we all know the world wants off of the petrol dollar. We all know how the world may not be liking the U.S. dollar with both an unpayable debt and historic money printing, among other things. It's bad. It's out of control. It's, this monetary game, this fiat experiment is, is on a ventilator itself. Um, we're really in weekend at, at Bernie's territory right now. Uh, economy, it's on a ventilator. Oil industry, probably on that, that same ventilator. So I guess, you know, if there's any silver lining in this, it's, it's a good thing that the U.S. is getting good at making ventilators because we're going to have to put industries on these ventilators. So let me take a look at what you guys are are saying out there Bartimus Roma oil getting cracked yeah it's it's really um I tell you oil is it's it's in a tough situation right now um you know um and let me just take a look at here Malaysia's already shutting down some oil rigs okay I'll look into that Nicholas Khan 9 I guess you're in Malaysia Nicholas um you would know you would know if you're if you're in Malaysia firsthand. Now I'll take <clears throat> I'll take a look at that also. <clears throat> Excuse me. Huge tankers hold oil will make money. Yeah, that's been leaking out also where a lot of guys have been saying buy tankers, buy tankers because it's going to have to end up going somewhere, right? And and they're looking at at tankers, but <clears throat> the tankers are going to sit. They're going to sit out at sea if if you you want to go ahead and buy tankers. 
<clears throat> don't forget that the part where they're going to be stuck at sea. They're not going to be able to offload either. So um, you're going to have to be paying. Uh, tankers are going to have expenses out there sitting at, at sea. So just be mindful of, of that also. Um, see what else is out there. Mark Hill. There you go. Mark Hill. I like that. Federal Reserve <laughs> needs a ventilator. Yeah. I like that. There you go. Like I said, it's a good thing that uh, countries are getting good at making ventilators. They're going to have to put their governments and industries on it. Uh, I think people people are going to revolt. You know, this keeps up. People are going to to get pretty upset, um, if not already. Uh, let's see. Calhoun, Busby, a second shock to the market is coming. Yeah, it's not over. It's It's just going to keep going and going and going for sure. Um, let's see what else is out there. Uh, full name oil will crash again when all storage is full and there's a surplus. Yeah, it, um, it's going to be tough. And, and that's why, you know, we, I wanted to bring up that geopolitical side because, you know, it, it's happened before in history <clears throat> where, as I just pointed out, Saudi and the U S partnered up, ganged up on Russia took Ru or the USSR took the USSR out this time around, you know, very well could be Russia and Saudi and, and, you know, China also helping where they're also ganging up on, on the U S and, you know, it, it's, it was bound to happen. You know, it just, it's just that it happened in our lifetime, but this thing was bound to, to happen. You know, um, I think even, you know, I'm, I'm from the U S <clears throat> but I think even guys from the U S have to, acknowledge the fact that this this thing eventually is going to happen sometime so it's just things unfolding in it's just that it's in our lifetime we're, we're the ones seeing it now but um you know like i say if you were in a different country you know you you don't want to have to exchange or change to a different currency to buy something when it's 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 you know you can just buy it in your own currency you know so that that's a problem and also weaponizing the the dollar, putting sanctions on it as <clears throat> as the U.S. often does. So, you know, we we just got to look at these things from a, a a true and honest perspective. You know, and and that's for me that that's just the way that I see it. So, you know, again, that's the the political geopolitical side. So, on one hand, we have that those geopolitical ideologies. And on the other hand, we have the markets, which is what we saw last week, where oil futures went negative. The shale industry, excuse me, the shale industry is hurting. The futures oil market, it's it's insane. It's so insane, you may as well call it outsane. Already. It's it's just that insane. And when we take a look at this, this was coming from, I believe it was, okay, FX Street. And this is where I got that number from. <clears throat> 40% of oil producers will, will go bankrupt if $30, <clears throat> excuse me, $30 oil persists. Hang on, hang on. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about that, guys. Based on forward charts, at least 40% of U.S. oil producers are headed for bankruptcy. <clears throat> excuse me. Inquiring minds are diving into the Kansas City Fed Energy Survey by Chad Wilkerson. Let me just check the date on this. Okay, so pretty current, April 21, 2020. Uh, before all of these crazy things happened, this is when oil was still in the in the teens and and um, or I should say twenty dollar range. <clears throat> Excuse me. District energy activity fell sharply during the first quarter of 2020, with our index dropping to its lowest level since we began the survey in early 2014. Let me just go through this real quick. <clears throat> Let me just get to the main parts. Um, let's see. Sixty-one percent of firms would remain solvent in the next year <clears throat> if the WTI price of oil would stay at thirty dollars per barrel, and sixty-four percent would stay solvent if it were forty. Well, we know this is we're way below this already. We are way below. So these numbers they are definitely going to come up. Uh, you're going to see more insolvent oil companies and i think there was one that that went bankrupt last week or or they were in a bit of trouble last week so if, if these prices hold 
<clears throat> which they didn't. The survey estimates about 39% of oil producers will go bankrupt. This number is going to come up. 39 will come up. Even at $40 per barrel, <laughs> which we are nowhere near, 36% of the firms would go bankrupt. And this is the huge problem. This is why, you know, Trump is trying to, to solve this thing. We will never... We will never let the great U.S. oil and gas industries down. I have instructed the Secretary of Energy and the Secretary of the Treasury to formulate a plan which will make funds available so that these very important companies and jobs will be secured long into the future. Okay, so we see that the actual physical producers of oil, they're heading into trouble. They need that. $30, $40 barrel, <clears throat> price per barrel range. It's not there. It's not there. And it's, it's not just the physical oil producers in trouble. It's also the paper oil traders, which is what we saw last week with the oil futures. Speculators, these guys, you know, they were, as some guy said, it was spooky. Well, <laughs> should buy physical, not paper. Anyway, speculators, they, they, Luke, let me just put it this way. Luke Groman had a, very good tweet about these guys who, who want to speculate. Excuse me. Let me pull up uh, Luke's tweet. Luke Groman, follow him if, if you guys can, uh, at Luke Groman. What he said a few days back. Alternate title. Traders who have apparently not had enough fun. <laughs> Traders who have not had enough fun with the paper shenanigans in oil. Block to the granddaddy of paper shenanigans. And he's talking about gold, the granddaddy, the granddaddy of paper shenanigans. And when we take a look at this article from Yahoo Finance, you know, it, it's almost like, I, I don't know, it's almost like you want to shake these guys and, and wake them up. You know, it, it just, it amazes me. Five top high-flying gold stocks shining on oil price collapse. So, gold stocks. So it's like, hey guys, let's move from from these oil futures into gold stocks. And in oil, they were never going to take delivery. And so this time they're going to go gold stocks, which they're probably never going to take delivery as well. So all these guys are doing is just speculating, playing the markets, and causing a lot of this price movement to to happen when in actuality, you know, it's you got the physical and the paper and you know, letting that paper control the physical price, it's, I, I just do not understand how that is. I understand its futures, but letting it control the, the, the physical price, you know, I think you're looking at two different things. Anyway, on April 20th, oil sector was dealt the worst blow in history thanks to the bug. The future price of U.S. crude oil, WTI, West Texas Intermediate for May delivery turned negative. For the first time ever, consequently, Wall Street closed sharply lower as investors scurried for safe haven assets like gold in apprehension of any recovery in the U.S. and the global economy. So now they want to run to gold, but they're running into gold stocks, paper. On April 20th, WTI came down. Uh, oil producers would have to pay $37.63 to the buyer in addition to the physical commodity crude oil this unprecedented situation occurred while owning while owing to sheer lack of demand imposition of partial or full lockdowns across the world resulted in a near complete stagnation of aviation road and sea transport this is true this is the consumption part where consumption is low and these are major sources of oil demand moreover manufacturing industries are mostly shut all over the world making the situation worse Consequently, the storage capacity of refineries is full, resulting in virtually zero demand for crude oil. Got to kind of wonder, you know, Netflix, more important than oil. Amazon, more important than oil. Apple, more important than oil. Microsoft, more important than oil. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Notably, the crude oil industry commands a large part of the U.S. economy. U.S. oil producers spend around $130 to $140 billion per annum in capital expenditure. Industry also provides a good chunk of high-paying jobs. As a result, collapse of crude oil price is likely to have a significant impact on the U.S. 
economy and and we know it is and this article basically what it's saying is you know they're they're taking a look at five gold stocks top picks <laughs> top picks at this stage it will be prudent prudent to invest in gold stocks <clears throat> with strong growth potential why not be prudent in buying physical we have narrowed down our search to five <clears throat> such stocks so anyway i'll 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 leave it there. So we got these guys who were who were playing oil futures, got burned. You know, they were going to have to take delivery. They panicked. And now their advice they're being given is, hey, how about going into, into paper gold? <laughs> why not go into paper gold? So amazing. And this is why things are going to, it looks like it's going to turn upside down, just as Roger had, had said earlier. So let me take a look at, take a look at some of these uh, comments here. <clears throat> Let's see. Potatoes, zucchini. Okay. <clears throat> Must be some recipe. Sorry about that, guys. Um, Slay, Onyx. Sooner or later, gold and silver will turn into unaffordium. Oh, where did it go? Swim? Unaffordium and unobtainium. Mike Maloney. Hey, he's got some. Those are some pretty choice words. Unaffordium and <clears throat> unobtainium. Excuse me. Kind of like Rick Rule with his automaton. Okay, which how many of you guys knew what automaton was? I I was just you know like, oh, what did he just say automaton? Anyway, um, let's see. Uh, just going through these comments real quick. <clears throat> okay, stock on USA Empire come. <laughs> Ralph Steiner, USSA Empire crumbling now like the Roman Empire. Yeah, I see a lot of guys starting to say ussa but you know it's just it's things are really changing and and we really got to take a look at all these things but and so anyway these um hang on let me move over here so while these guys are having <clears throat> excuse me fun in the paper markets in the real world low oil prices cause wars okay, real oil prices Caused wars. And let me back up a bit. What I mean by this is, let me just come down to the end of the article here. Uh, what's next for oil after prices go negative? Saudis, other producers expected to do more to curb supply. But let me go down to to the bottom <clears throat> and just get to that that last part. Okay, a shutdown of output on top of a 60 to 90% drop in crude oil prices. So let's just say a drop in crude oil prices is a catastrophe for countries that depend on oil revenues or public finance, servicing foreign currency debt or income. The worst trouble spots are places like Venezuela, who we just saw earlier having problem with food, Nigeria and Iran, but even Mexico and Brazil are on the ropes at these prices, especially if production has to be shut down. And this is why money is going to be thrown into the industry to prevent it from being shut down. So on top of the bug containment problems, we are seeing potential sovereign debt crisis in the making. Sovereign debt crisis. So, you know, again, while these guys are having funds, having fun in the paper markets, in the real world, low oil prices, they cause war. They cause civil unrest. So imagine all the smaller nations who depend on oil revenue or other commodities as revenue. They are going to have civil unrest. Their government is going to reach deeper into their citizens' pockets. And what about all the money printing? The cheapening of oil, the cheapening of money. You know, what's, what's really going to become of this? What is really going to become of this? And so I found um, this article, the bailout, the Fed, and the aftermath. And I won't go through the whole thing. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty long article. I'll, I'll put it here for you guys. Okay. The bailout, the Fed, and the aftermath. A conversation with former Federal Reserve Governor Sarah Bloom Raskin. Okay. Let's see what it has to say. Sarah Bloom Raskin, okay, this is a little bit about her, <clears throat> her background. So she was asked, what concerns you 
about the uh, long-term consequences of these emergency measures undertaken by the Federal Reserve and the 2.2 trillion CARES legislation once the crisis is behind us. Former Fed Governor's response, we are in the midst of a massive restructuring of the economy. It might be hard to see because of the pandemic, but the actions taken by the Federal Reserve and by Congress in the CARES Act will have profound consequences for the economic landscape, both in terms of economic concentration and inequality. Inequality, and we touched on this where who is going to be saved? The, the concentration, you're going to see fewer companies and you're going to see inequality where they are going to get the lion's share of things and or, or funds or help and other companies are not. They're going to be left to fend for themselves. So as we've seen in responses to other economic crises, a stark divide is showing up between buoyant sentiments in financial markets and impoverished economic conditions on the ground. That's never, never a good formula for inclusive recovery. She goes on to say the Federal Reserve is going to have a $9 trillion balance sheet, presumably by the end of the year. It looks like it may be earlier. And this is unprecedented. So we have to understand the consequences. First, in terms of the size, has the Fed itself become a direct market participant? Okay. In terms of this size, has the Fed itself become a direct market participant? Question mark. There's a question mark there. It's not a statement. It's a question. But also in terms of the substance of its holdings, what exactly does the $9 trillion portfolio consist of? She says, with the Fed's latest decision to purchase and take as collateral new categories of risky assets, namely less than investment grade, these policies could affect a major transfer of wealth to holders of junk bonds and other risky asset classes. So, there, so there's this initial transfer of wealth which in extreme could look like a dumping onto the Fed's balance sheet of risky and unsustainable debt from firms that made poor investment decisions. Are we going to think about paying for these private blunders as a necessary byproduct of an otherwise prudent liquidity facility? Or is it some backdoor attempt to saddle the American people with other people's bad assets? Or is it a new privatized bypass to the bankruptcy code. All of these things, they basically lead to, to this. I mean, it's, it, the article goes deep. Um, I left the link there. You can go into it. But basically, it leads to no confidence. It leads to no confidence. And this is one reason why we saw Bank of America coming out and say, go to reach 3000 50% above its record. So this is what Bank of America is saying. So Bank of America raised its 18-month gold price target to $3,000 an ounce, more than 50% of the existing price record in a report titled, The Fed Cannot Print Gold. The Fed Cannot Print Gold. And that goes back to the whole sound money argument, right? The bank increased its target from 2000 previously as policymakers across the globe unleashed vast amounts of fiscal and monetary stimulus to help shore up economies hurt by the coronavirus. I'll just have a few comments and I'll, I'll get to your, your, um, your comments. So let's try to re reason this. Shorts have, in simple terms, let's just say shorts have oil. Let's just say ready to deliver. Longs were stuck and would have to take delivery. The price of oil comes crashing into negative territory. Again, the longs, there were no way, there was no way they were going to take that oil. It's just purely speculation. In contrast with gold, the shorts might not even have the gold. Shorts might not even have the gold, and the longs rarely take delivery. This is why we saw that article from Yahoo Finance saying, hey, okay, so the gig's up with, with paper oil futures. Let's, let's go into uh, paper gold. Okay. So, you know, this is looking to change. You know, if, if these guys do this, I think they stand a chance of, of getting burnt in, in gold as well because this thing is looking to, to change. 
The opposite of what's happening with oil may indeed happen with gold, where the longs, they may want delivery. So in oil, they didn't want delivery with gold, they may want it. And the shorts don't have the gold. And if there is one thing the oil market told us, shenanigans absolutely do abound in these futures markets. What we saw with oil will happen with gold. You know, things keep up the way it is. The guys are going to want to hold that, that physical. They're going to want the physical gold, not the paper. So what we saw with oil will happen with gold, but in the opposite. Longs will want delivery, and the shorts won't have it. And when that happens, that $3,000 projection by Bank of America is going to prove to be way, way, way too low. Gold and silver, really. Get it? Got it. Good. Get it? Got it. Good. Get a store of value because value is going to need to be stored, period. Value is going to need to be stored somewhere period. It's looking, it's searching, it's going to move across everything. Stocks, bonds, I mean, the equities. Value is going to move across everything. It's going to move across commodities and it's going to find its home. It's going to find its home in silver and gold. I just want to play this one clip from, from Rick Rule. Now, I think in the equities, we head into a perfect storm in a positive sense. The price uh, that you sell your product for is denominated in a relatively strong currency and is rising. That is the U.S. dollar. But particularly if you are a non-U.S. oriented producer, your currency uh, is falling, which means that your input costs are declining. Increased product prices with decreasing costs are a very good thing. Add on top of that the collapse in oil prices which has in many cases halved companies' energy costs, and you are set up for a wonderful set of circumstances. Many of your listeners say, well, why hasn't this blessed event occurred? That's fairly easy to discuss. Precious metals prices don't rise as an immediate consequence of a crisis. They rise as a consequence of the policy response to the, price, to, to the crisis. That's why you're starting to see the gold price increase now. Remember that silver prices lag gold prices. So silver bugs, be patient. Your time is coming. Yeah, be patient. <laughs> be patient. Silver bugs, be patient. Your your time is coming. And you know, I think I think a lot of us are okay with that. It just gives us more more time to to accumulate. So, you know, again, what we saw with oil, uh, the opposite can happen with with gold and um. You know, just to um, give credit, when I, I took a look at that Peter Schiff clip, you know, the idea came from him. It stemmed from him. And when I went and, and did the research, you know what? He's, he's probably right. You know, I mean, I, I think, you know, the opposite of, of what's happening in oil is going to happen in gold. Guys are going to want to, to take that, that delivery. They're not going to be interested in, in, in the paper. So, you know, if, if you can, you know, make sure you... Try to get some gold and silver. You know, do try and do that if, if you can. Um, I don't want to give, it's not financial advice, professional or otherwise. I'm just trying to say, you know, this is what I do, okay? I mean, you know, you, you get paid, you get your salary. Go ahead and flip it over into some silver, some gold, but try not to over leverage. You know, last thing you want to do is have to sell back your, your silver or gold when you're trying to accumulate your, your position in silver and gold. And why accumulate? It's not necessarily because you expect it to, to go to the moon. It's because you expect trouble with fiat currencies and it's your insurance. It's your store of value. Like I was saying, value is going to start to move across. It's going to move across every, everything out there. It's going to move across stocks. It's going to move across bonds. It's going to move across commodities. And I do think value is going to find its home in gold and silver as far as being able to be stored. Um, so we look at oil. There's no storage for oil. It's dropping. But with, you know, it, value, if it, if it comes into silver and gold, you're going to see silver and gold go up. Uh, there's still silver and gold up there. And, I mean, out there, we're seeing, actually, I, I should let you know, we, we are seeing um, 
refineries and mints are, are coming back online. So it is going to be possible to, to get some physical once again, a little bit higher premiums, but this is where money is going to go into. Um, it's going to be looking for a place to, to be stored and you want it to be stored in, in that, that gold and silver. And, you know, if um, gold and silver starts getting a little bit scarce, as we saw, starts to go up and um, spot price, what is spot price at that point anymore? You know, I mean, um, the physical market, it's it's reacting very differently from, from the spot price. So even if you see spot price go down, the um, thing is people are still buying it above spot price. So um, we're seeing two very, very different different things. Uh, so looking at, take a look at some of your comments or head out as well. Uh, let's see. Rolf Steiner, our negative food price is coming. Uh, uh, should I wait until then to start prepping? <laughs> I, I don't think food prices are going to go cheaper. If you can get what you need, you know, just, just get, get what you need. Michael Mona, don't be a debt slave. How you doing, my friend? Um, absolutely. You know, try not to, to be a debt slave as, as, as best you can. Um, but taking those two words that you've said, debt slave, a lot of countries are in debt right now. Uh, U.S. is surely in debt right now. So then that word slave comes into play. Who's going to be the master? Who's going to take over? You know, who's going to, who's going to fill in the shoes that the U.S. is going to be pushed out of? You know, is it going to be someone else, one country, a conglomerate, conglomerate of countries? Is it going to be the whole one world thing? You know, and, and that's the thing. If <clears throat> when the U.S. leaves those shoes, who's going to fill it? And is it going to be better? Is it going to be worse? So yeah, that, that, that's something to, to consider as well. Can we do bartering silver to gold? Nicholas Kahn, you know, I, I wish it could be a straight one-to-one -one shot. Um, I think, you know, really it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but you also got to consider the premiums for silver are hugely, vastly different than the premiums for gold. So it's not exactly where, let's say, if you look at the ratio and, and 115, you say, okay, I should get, if I have 115 ounces of silver, I should be able to go down, give it to the dealer, and he should give me one ounce of gold. Doesn't really, doesn't really work that way because there are different premiums attached. But, you know, I think dealers, they sometimes can be flexible. So it's always good to, to check because sometimes it, it can be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, okay, it's a good question. Anna Maxa, thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, appreciate that. What's what's also appreciated is is again your your comments. Um, because I tell you, I, I've been saying this for a while. A lot of guys are sitting on the fence, and they may or may not be listening to what I'm saying. But I, I promise you, they're looking at what you're saying. So your your comments are are hugely hugely important. And so let, let's let's give some good comments because in the end, we we want to help guys, right? That's what we want to do. Um. You know, we don't want to be too, um, people make mistakes sometimes, you know, you don't want to bash them necessarily for that, but you, you really want to try and, and, and lend people a hand, pick them up, pick people up when they're down and, and get everybody standing on their feet again. Because, you know, as we've also talked about with all this money coming out, you go back to 2011 QE, Wall Street, they've never been able to get off that punch bowl. Uh, each time we tried, they fall. They, they, they would fall and fall and fall, and we had to put that punch bowl in front of them before again and again and again. And this is the fear with people right now. People need some relief. They're being given relief. Um, they're being given some financial relief. The fear is, will they be able to, to get off that punch bowl? In, in fact, I just want to, if I can go back, I, I want to uh, go and show you one more thing from, from Twitter. Let me try and get back there. Okay, I'll just show you one, one more thing from Twitter. Um, let's see. Okay, th this is the article here. Uh, it, and it kind of brings the point home where, you know, people are going to rather stay home than, than go to, to work. Okay, so let me show you that, that article. This is from CNBC. She got a forgivable loan. Hang on, let me just clear this. She got a forgivable loan, but her employees hate her for it. Okay, so this was just um, 
a few days ago as well. Okay. So Jamie Black Lewis felt like she won the lottery after giving two or after getting two forgivable loans through the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. It should be good news, right? So Black Lewis saw the $177,000 and $43,800 loans, one for each of the spas she owns in Washington State as a lifeline she could use for payroll and other business expenses. Should be good, right? She can pay, she can pay her employees. She halted pay for 35 employees, including herself, when, when this uh, whole thing first happened. And when Black Lewis convened a virtual employee meeting to explain her good fortune, she expected jubilation and relief that paychecks would resume in full, even though the staff, primarily hourly employees, couldn't work. But it should be good news. She, she was granted money, uh, uh, loan-free money, and she was going to be able to pay her employees a full-time salary even though they could not come to work. Should be good news, but she got a different reaction. It was a firestorm of hatred about the situation. The animosity is an unintended consequence of the $2.2 trillion bug relief package that was enacted last month. So the law, this CARES Act, it was loans for small businesses that were struggling due to the bug. Among them, the bulk of the funds, funds must go to payroll. Salaries must remain intact and employee headcount must not decrease. So people are going to keep their jobs. They're going to give full-time salaries or, or the salary is going to be what it was. Businesses have until June 30 to rehire, laid off, or furloughed workers. So Black Lewis was trying to meet these rules, especially after her bank reiterated she must continue to pay workers for loan forgiveness. But the anger came from employees who determined they'd make more money by collecting unemployment benefits than their normal paychecks. It's a windfall they see coming, Black Lewis said of unemployment. In their mind, I took it away. I couldn't believe it, she added. What On what planet am I competing with unemployment? What, and, and this is the problem. You put that punch bowl in front of people, it's going to be hard to take that punch bowl away. And I, I tell you, this is going to be a, a very, very difficult thing where people, they're basically going to become wards of the state. You know, the state is going to have to take care of you. That seems like what these, where these guys are headed at. Uh, Michael Mona, that's, thank you. My friend, appreciate that, Michael. Appreciate that. Um, really do appreciate that. Uh, make sure you you've got enough things to take care of yourself first. That that's the most important thing, right? Take care of your your family first. Be that blessing. Be that blessing, not not a burden. Make sure your your family, your friends, you guys are okay first. But thank you, appreciate that, Michael. And then also, Lark Ball. Appreciate that also. Uh, MMT is a massive moral hazard. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is the, it's a very, very dangerous thing that, that we're walking into. I mean, people, they're going to love the government for making them wards of the state. Uh, it's, it's a crazy thing. It's an upside down world for sure. Larkball, thank you. Same thing also. Make sure you have enough to, to take care of your, your friends and family first. Um, we'll, we'll be here, but we appreciate, we appreciate what, what you, um, your, your offerings. Appreciate that very much. Thank you. Uh, comments, questions, kick can down the road. Larry Chang. Absolutely. Uh, again, thank you. Larko. Appreciate it. Uh, Robert Dirks. That's very good, but you have to store your wealth in the right form. Robert. True. True. You have to store it in the right form. And along with that, um, Whatever form you, you decide, the correct form for yourself to be, consider diversifying the location. Um, you, you may not want to be keeping everything you have in one place, even in one country for that matter. Do consider trying to spread things around. Um, you know, like I say, if, if, imagine your finger being, being this needle right now. Is your country 
headed to safety and stability or, or chaos? If you feel it's headed toward chaos, then you need to ask yourself, okay, then what countries are headed toward peace and stability? And then maybe start looking at those countries, start researching, and then see if it fits because it, it's not a perfect fit for everyone, but for others, it, it is. And if they can move things around, they look to move things around. So try to consider diversifying the location if if you can, if you can. Um, it's Again, everything's a, every situation is different for, for everyone. Um, okay, let's see. Hoster of Corcosa, how are you doing, my friend? The way things are going, I would recommend people hold at least 30% of savings in PMs. It's going to go further down before it's better. Um, have something if, if you if you can really have have something. Uh, Fib, how are you doing, my friend? Uh, let's see, George Kaiser. It's exceptional because they can print the reserve currency exorbitant exorbitant privilege. Yeah, that that's that's a problem. I mean, like I say, imagine yourself. It's a big world. Imagine yourself in a different, if you're in the U.S., imagine yourself in a different country. And, you know, the U.S. dollars, the reserve currency, you, you know, it's, it, um, put it this way. When I was back in the States, never once did I have to trade into a foreign currency. I never even knew what a money changer was until I left the States. And then I've seen what money changers were and, and, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty big deal. So, you know, I guess back in the States, we, we may not see these things as much. Um, it's understandable. But when you're outside, you really see things from a, a different perspective, you know, and, and you see things in a much, much broader, um, broader, broader picture. Uh, nothing to do with intelligence. Now, it's just to say that naturally, if, if you're, you're in a different place, you're going to see things from a, from a different lens. So, you know, it, um, it's always good to consider the other side. You know, it's, it's, it's always the best way to consider the, the other side. Um, okay, so let's see. Are the Solomon Islands stable? Um, I suppose you're talking about um, you have a lot of companies that go and set up businesses in lesser-known uh, places. Um, I, I can't comment on what they do. I, I understand why they do what they do. Uh, they look for different jurisdictions that, that can favor them or that can, uh, companies will set up there in a different jurisdiction that, that can favor you. So, so to speak. So I understand why, why they do that, but I can't, um, I can't comment on Solomon Islands government. It, for me, I, I simply look at it this way. I think a lot of you guys out there, you, you buy silver coins and you buy these coins that say, um, Tuvalu, New way. You buy these coins that have all these different countries on them, right? The thing is, they're not minted there. They're not minted in Tuvalu. They're not minted in New way. They're not minted in Cook Islands or any of those places. They're not minted there. And so a lot of guys, they, they buy these coins thinking, oh, I have a coin from the Cook Islands. I have a coin from Tuvalu. I have a coin from New way. But it's not. It's, it's really not so. So they use these governments, a mint will use these governments and uh but the coin is it's not really from there they basically give these governments uh, a cut or you know a percentage and from what i understand anyway and that's how i kind of look at some of these these companies especially when they they venture into the south pacific uh part of of the world you know i could be wrong i'm just sharing my opinion but i kind of compare it to coins that say you know Tuvalu and, and all of these other places and they didn't really come from there so you know you you got to do your research that that's the best thing I could say do do your research it's a good question but do do your research um okay uh so okay I think you guys are okay um everything looks good you guys got some good conversation going on there that's that, that's awesome um okay so what I'll do is I'll I'll, I'll head out and again, we got that Tuomas Malanen interview coming up, and I, I know he's going to have some choice things to say. Uh, he's very um attuned to to what's what's really going on. He's he's not a he's smart, but he's not exactly the academic type where you know they're just basically trying to get everything from a book. He sees the real world, and and he knows 
where to fit things in the real world. So I do hope you'll join us. So subscribe, definitely subscribe and, and click on the bell. So you know, you'll be notified when that interview comes up. But you guys definitely, please do take care during these times. Um, whether or not this virus is real or fake, we're, we'll find out. You know, looking back at some of the things we, we touched on, you know, the virus is one. Um, of course, oil futures is another. And of course, how gold definitely can react in the opposite to the way oil futures did. So just make sure you take care of each other. That That's the first thing. Take care of yourselves. Be that blessing and, and not a burden because look like there's going to be a lot of things that, that are going to put people in some very, very hard times. And um, we got to do our best to to take care of them because if we don't, <clears throat> state will. And if they're looking to the state to take care of them, you are looking at um, you're looking at things like socialism and, and all these other things. So we got to try and do our best, right? Um, so as always, you know, thank you guys also. Appreciate you being here. As always, saddle up for what's coming ahead and silver up. I'll see you guys next week. Take care and God bless. <laughs>